Nice. Thanks, Matthew. Good evening, everyone. Um, so when uh, Matthew asked me to speak uh, tonight, uh, this was a, a sort of nascent meetup with um, not, not an obvious demographic. So I've sort of tried to pitch this somewhere middle of the road. Um, and uh, if, it's, uh, if it's a lot of content that you've heard before, then um, I'm going to apologize. But feel free to ask uh, more complicated questions at the end. Um, if it is uh, content that seems way too complex for you, again, um, I will clarify if you want to shout, shout some questions. We're a small enough group that uh, we can probably, uh, probably withstand a bit of, if not heckling, then at least interaction. Um, so I'm going to talk about a brief history of cloud infrastructure. Um, and I've tried to make this a little bit autobiographical, because my career uh, since my computer science degree in Manchester in, uh, when I started in 1997 has kind of tracked um, the internet industry to a point. I was not around uh, doing this stuff in the bubble necessarily, but sort of on the tail end of it. Um, at the time at which I was first employed, we were hearing about all the uh, million dollar um, corporate parties put on in Hawaii by brands that then disappeared six months later for having run out of money for you know, strange reasons. Um, so we're going to go back kind of to 1999. We're to, I don't think they were the bad old days necessarily, but they were definitely, uh, definitely different to where we are now. Um, this group of people here was a company called Designer Servers. We were based in Manchester. This was my first employer. Um, you might be able to spot me in there. Um, I have more beard now than I had. Uh, it's over there on the left. Um, and this was, this was the gig that I came to straight out of uh, university. In fact, during my, uh, during my vocational year, I did two years of, of study, one year out with these reprobates uh, and uh, another year thereafter back at uh, uni. And rather than going out looking for a job at the end of that, um, I did the imaginative thing of just going back here and saying, would you like to employ me again? Uh, where I went into the support desk and then ultimately into, the, uh, into running the systems team there. Um, Designer Servers was uh, one of the earlier ISPs in, uh, in the UK, selling primarily to web designers um, packages where they could FTP uh, websites or, or use front page as it was then um, to get their, their stuff online. Uh, and my support desk sort of helped them do that uh, whilst uh, the, the product itself was basically a Linux server that they had a, a reasonable amount of access to. And so we were taking people from the sort of design community um, who, who were mostly at that point getting out of print media and into, uh, into digital work, uh, and then <laughs> throwing a Linux command line at them and saying, this is how you do internet. Um, and that was, there was mixed success. Um, there were some people doing pretty well at it, um, but our support desk helped the, the others. Uh, we were working out of this building here, which is uh, on uh, uh, Chester Road in, uh, in Manchester, if you know that. Uh, nice Victorian house. Uh, fun fact, the, uh, the satellite dish that you can see rusting on the side of it there uh, was put up because the guy who ran the company thought that he was going to stream, uh, live stream a rave uh, on the New Year's Eve 1999 to, to the world. And this showed up on the building maybe a month before. And we definitely didn't have enough time to do anything with that. Uh, also, uh, I think violated building codes because it was too big for the structure. But it's still there. No one's really bothered with it. Um, and the, the building now is, uh, is used by other companies. At the time, the directors lived upstairs. Uh, they were at university in Salford. Uh, and their servers uh, lived in something a bit like this. I couldn't find an actual picture of the server room, but it was a cellar. Um, it was prone to a little bit of damp. We used to rack servers a little higher off the ground than you might otherwise do. Uh, and if you picture that this green thing here, rather than being a, a hose pipe, which I assume it is, was a two megabit connection from what used to be called Norweb, uh, a single two megabit connection from what used to be called Norweb. Uh, that was how we connected our, our servers to the, the internet, a kind of loose bit of string. Uh, the shelves over there, uh, we also had a set of shelves, although ours looked maybe a little bit more like this. Um, they were literally desktop PCs that, we, that you just go buy off the market and, uh, and, and plug in. Um, and so this was what we would, we definitely wouldn't refer to this as cloud computing now, but this is kind of, we were selling uh, internet hosting from this kind of setup. So our, my experience of working in the cloud is sort of nascent uh, from here onwards. Um, installing a new server was uh, a time consuming activity. You go out to, uh, to either the, the local PC store or a couple of uh, people who were kind of cobbling together PCs from parts um, at the time. Uh, and we place an order, and usually there'd be a sort of two or three week lead time, depending on uh, whether um, you know the, the, the prevailing winds of, uh, of factory disasters and earthquakes and stuff in Asia meant that RAM chips weren't available or they were too expensive or whatever. Um, so 
you're kind of from the from ideation of I want a new server to I've got this server physically in my hands and I can do things with it uh, would typically be measured in in weeks, um, and that's that's these days almost unconscionable amount of time. Um, servers would arrive in one of these, uh, and then you have a lot of these fucking things to deal with. Um, usually uh, on server delivery days, we just have bags and bags of these things racked up outside, ready for the, uh, for the baffled bin man to take away. Uh, then you take a, take a crimp tool and you'd make a, a RJ45 uh, crimped cable uh, and then you plug it into a switch um, uh, to provide networking, although realistically the switch would look something a little bit more like this. Uh, hands up if you've ever worked in a data center with one of those. No? Yeah, well, you two probably have. Um, and then we'd configure the switch, um, assuming that you could remember the commands to do that, because this is something that you didn't do very often because it took weeks to order servers. Uh, and that only worked if you could find one of these, and you've got one of these with every switch. Um, but they were never around when you wanted them. They seemed to obey the same laws of physics as lighters and biros and plectrums, and that uh, you definitely used to have one, but you don't anymore. And somehow, there aren't as many of them as you think there should be in your house. Um, Installing the server itself, uh, we used to put one of these in every, every server. Um, not a cup holder, this was a CD drive, we probably remember those. Um, and uh, the installation was predicated on you finding the right one of these, um, and it not being scratched, and it not having been, uh, been used to prop up a wobbly desk or something of that nature. If you didn't have one of those, then you'd probably have to sit down and burn one, and in 1999 that took an awful lot of time, uh, and often didn't work the first time either. So having burnt one of these or found one of these and put it in the cup holder and closed the thing, then you've got a lot of stupid questions to answer. Um, and stupid questions like, do you want to test the media? Never say yes to this, because assuming you've just burnt it, you're going to sit and watch that for 45 minutes, and you definitely don't want to be doing that. Um, but other more reasonable questions like, what network address would you like this server to have? Would you like this type of software on it? And having answered all these stupid questions, then you'd wait. And you'd wait. <laughs> And you wait. And typically, because we're talking about um, 1999 speed IDE drives, um, you were probably waiting maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes for, for this to install a reasonable Linux distribution uh, with most of the things on it that you would want. And then once you'd finished watching this thing uh, tick over, you'd probably go out for a coffee, maybe try and do something else. Uh, then you'd come back and do a lot of typing. Um, and the, the type of typing you'd do would probably be either things that you'd had written down or you've got in a text file on another computer somewhere um, and you're, uh, you're just typing commands, getting things up and running until finally, after probably about three hours total, uh, you'd be able to serve a web page from this thing. Phew. Okay, so while doing this every few weeks, probably not that big a deal, um, but it was definitely time consuming to the point where the, uh, the, the biggest, uh, biggest amount of time that you're spending from ideation to be able to use this thing and thereby make money from it because we were selling these to, to customers, um, you know, sort of three weeks or so uh, typically. And this little sliver of yellow on the end suggests that it doesn't take very long to, to configure it. Actually, um, by comparison to the three weeks of waiting, it's not very long, but actually there's still a bunch of manpower and, uh, and time involved doing that. So a little later on than that, we were growing up a bit. Um, we realized um, after one or two incidents uh, that living out of a, a damp cellar in a Victorian house where the, uh, the directors used to uh, sleep upstairs was not the most grown up way of running a business. Um, and so we moved our, some of our servers initially and then followed by the rest of them into a data center. Um, now, I've been in data centers. None of them look this clean, tidy or orderly. <laughs> I'm fairly sure this is a rendering, but you get the idea. These are, these are rooms um, near good sources of power, good diverse sources of power, uh, typically diverse sources of, of networking, um, air conditioned, uh, air filtered, um, and, uh, and pretty clean. Uh, and these things are lockable racks uh, where 16 inch servers just get sort of slotted in on rails um, until those things are full, uh, and then you go into another rack, and another rack, and another rack, and so on. So if you've ever been in uh, Manchester Science Park, for example, um, Telecity, now owned by, not Telecity, I can't remember, somebody bought them recently. Um, they had a couple of rooms like this, uh, definitely not as clean as this, usually with kind of uh, dust and bits of uh, cable ends and, and drums of Cat5 stuff lying around, but still better than what we were, where we were hosting previously. Um, so we'd grown up and we got, got into this place. So having grown up our, where we put these things, um, we now move on to growing up how we install them. So we're talking now about network installation, which allows us to throw the CD away entirely. Uh, and network installation um, 
is a sort of uh, a process by which you trick your server into thinking that there's a CD drive over there that it can get at, uh, and then you do run the installer from that. So you're still uh, still running a, um, the the same installer as you would from a CD, but you've picked it up off the network, and your um, the answers to the stupid questions are perhaps baked into something on the network as well. So from getting the server, which is still at this point taking three weeks. Um, racking it, which now involves going into a cold room um, and listening to air conditioning for the amount of time that it takes you to screw into the into the post of a, of a rack um, and hopefully do a better job of cabling than the one that I showed you earlier. Um, we're now booting the machine. It's coming off off the network. Um, it's getting all of its stupid questions answered automatically. Um, and now it's ready to use in a, in a fairly sort of unattended, hands-off way. And the process is called kickstarting at the time. Um, in, in the Windows world, uh, there were other, other names for that. Um, so we've now got a server up and running uh, where we haven't ever had to put a CD drive in it, which is good because they were another 60 quid a piece and you don't really want to do that. Um, but we're still doing some typing. We've still got the machine up and running. We're like, okay, now we need to install these packages. We need to put some users on it. We need to put a web server on it and make sure that this is now usable to, uh, to, the, uh, to the client so we can sell it on. Um, so not really much difference in this graph. Um, this, this line here is actually a bit shorter, um, but you can't see that because the, the amount of time taken is still primarily in the procurement phase. So in 2001 um, came the, the dawn, and certainly in the, in the sort of PC world, x86 world, of the hypervisor, um, which was uh, when VMware released their, uh, their virtualization platform. Um, the hypervisor is interesting. And in a, in a regular server, um, you have this kind of layout here. So if you assume that the bottom here is your hardware, you've got uh, RAM and disk and networking devices and, and uh, CD drives and the blinky lights on the front. Uh, usually on a regular host, a normal native host, uh, you have an operating system kernel running. And the operating system is the, the, the thing that uh, allows application code to get at bits of the hardware. It's how your web server is able to talk to the network. Uh, it's how your, uh, your graphics can come off disk so that you can serve them up in your web pages. Um, and so on a native host, you're running multiple applications on a single kernel instance on one piece of hardware. What VMware allowed you to do, uh, and what other hypervisors now allow you to do, uh, was instead of having a, a regular running kernel, on top of the hardware, you run this thing called a hypervisor, which to the untrained eye looks quite a lot like a kernel, but doesn't do all of the same sorts of things. This is what we call a type one hypervisor, which definitely doesn't have anything other than hypervisor running on it. The hypervisor allows you to split that now bigger server into lots of smaller pretend ones. Uh, and these are virtual machines, hence VM. Uh, and the virtual machine uh, provides a, uh, a pretend layer of hardware that looks like the real hardware in the machine. So a pretend disk, a pretend lump of memory, a pretend processor, um, a pretend network card. And so we can do an install in the same unattended way or with a, with a pretend CD image um, of the operating system and run a kernel on this virtual hardware. Um, and then we can run our applications on that. So this was pretty revelatory because it meant that you could buy smaller numbers of bigger servers uh, and put those into your data centers. Your power consumption would be lower as a result. Um, it would be easier and uh, easier to rack them. Um, the, you'd be more sort of uh, dense on, on storage space, so you didn't need quite as many racks. Uh, and this took off in a massive way, particularly in the, in the sort of enterprises uh, who were now um, bursting at the seams of their data centers and wanted to consolidate their, uh, their hardware into, into fewer machines. <clears throat> and so with this kind of new way of looking at the world, um, you get a new way of installing stuff. You don't actually need to run the installer per virtual machine and run a, run a network install or put a CD in it or, and answer the questions and what have you. Um, what you could do then is create a machine template, which is essentially copy and paste for servers, or for virtual servers. And so you take your machine uh, and install it in the usual way, and then you use this uh, console application on another computer somewhere else and say, create a template. Um, and now if you've got shared storage between all of your machines running the VMware hypervisor, um, you can boot a new machine by saying, I'd like to create this one from a template. It would copy the, uh, copy the machine image over. You'd have another machine. Um, and the amount of time taken there is really negligible. Uh, so this, this row here um, takes as long as it takes to boot a VM um, as, 
the, the amount of time it, it takes to become ready is just as long as it takes to run a VM. Um, obviously, someone's going to still procure the hypervisor machines. Someone's going to go out and, and rack these bigger machines. But the theory has it in this case that someone else is managing that and pre predicting the amount of, uh, of hardware you need in advance um, so that when you are, as an application developer, saying, I need some new servers, you can just go and create them. Um, and the VMware hypervisor allowed you to do other kind of cool things um, like over-provision resources. So you could pretend that your uh, server with this much resource actually had this much resource, uh, which meant that you could buy yourself a little bit more time if you had uh, forgotten to buy more servers to put this thing on. Um, so this allows a, a kind of split responsibility model. Uh, and this sort of model uh, played out across uh, industry all over the place, primarily because I think you... you then end up being able to more easily outsource the running of your servers uh, within a data center. Um, so you'd end up with this sort of split here where you've got um, the hypervisor and the hardware is taken care of this by this infrastructure team uh, who might be locked in a basement and, and that you never have to talk to or, uh, or might be kind of outsourced to another company or that you can broadly ignore. Um, and the, uh, the applications team, who you might be working for if you were writing software, uh, can then allocates new virtual machines on top of that hypervisor uh, within a certain kind of um, uh, number of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, quota. Uh, so your, your infrastructure team might say, okay, you have a quota of eight servers at this size. Uh, please let us know if you're going to go over that. And they use that to predict demand and, and install, them, uh, install new servers ahead of the time when you'd need them, which is great, right? The, this now lets you worry about the thing that runs your application rather than all of this other stuff. You never have to go into a cold room putting cables in the back of things or looking around for Cisco rollover cables or any of that kind of stuff. That all becomes someone else's problem. Perfect. So in 2004, um, the, the dawning of, or the, the increasing of popularity of uh, infrastructure as code. Um, now, basically, infrastructure as code um, lets you take this part away from the install process. So you no longer, having installed a new server or virtual server, um, come and type a load of commands on it to make sure that, uh, that everything is installed that you want it to be. There's no copying and pasting out of a text file or open your big book of commands that you would ordinarily run on a machine. Um, this, uh, to a large extent, revolutionized, I think, the way I, I worked, certainly, um, and uh, the way that a lot of the industry uh, thought about how it managed servers. And, Essentially, what it allows you to do is to take those commands uh, and turn them into software instead. Uh, and the, the tools that allow us to do this, the, these days, the, the, the main kind of three are Chef, Puppet, and Ansible. Um, I happen to be a Puppet guy, so the example I'll give you is going to be in Puppet. Um, these tools allow us to, uh, to express the desired state of a server uh, in lines of code which might look something a little bit like this. This is a, a, a couple of, of resources. Uh, the first one creates a user called jtopper, uh, sets a, a shell and a home directory for, for him, because it's me, in fact. Um, and the next one starts, ensures that the, uh, the web server service is running on that, uh, on that server. Um, and so you, this sort of looks like commands, right? You're kind of thinking, well, I'm still going to type these things, John. Why, why is this beneficial? Well, if you're typing commands into a, into a command prompt when you've just booted a machine, um, you'll probably fuck it up at least once, particularly if you're, in, if you're doing a lot of these things in one go or if you've spent the last three hours fighting the, the, uh, the Dell rails so that they'll fit in the rack and you're quite angry and low on blood sugar because you haven't been for lunch yet. It's very easy to, to do a bad job of configuring machines in that sort of mindset. Um, this description of desired state um, isn't implemented quite the same way as running commands in of themselves. Uh, what we do in, in this sort of configuration as code uh, universe is specify what we would like the machine to look like. Then when the, co when the uh, uh, configuration management tool runs, it reads this configuration here, looks at the current state of the server, and determines whether or not it needs to make changes to get to that point. So the first time I run this code um, on a new machine, if there's no JTOPPER user, it's going to create one. Uh, if, the if the HTTPD service is not running, it will start it for, for me. Um, the second time I run the same configuration management tool, which I might do immediately afterwards to check that this has done all the right things, it should make no changes because the server's already in the desired states. If, uh, for some reason, the web server dies or um, somebody logs in and starts making changes to, I don't know, my, uh, my home directory configuration, 
if I've got this configuration as code running periodically, then uh, it will notice that the desired state of the server differs from the current state of the server, uh, and so we'll put it back. So now you can see this, this sort of fairly powerful uh, concept, um, well, simple concept but, but in which you can do really powerful things, uh, means that we can express the entire configuration of a whole server uh, in something that looks a bit like software. And if we're doing things that look like software, um, for Sally, it's faster. You don't need to go and get your big book of commands out and start typing. Um, it's more repeatable. So if I'm deploying hundreds of servers that look the same, then I'm definitely going to get the same results if I run the same uh, configuration management on them. Um, and as a result of that, I can now test my, uh, my configurations more easily. Um, I might run a, uh, run a configuration run on a virtual machine, make some changes, run it again, make some changes, run it again, blow the machine away, put it back, start again, make sure that I get the desired output. That workflow becomes much more like running software in a, in a software development lifecycle. Uh, and it also gives us the opportunity to use version control, uh, which means that we can store changes to that software in something like GitHub or, or a, another tool of that nature. Uh, and that means that if more than one of us are working on that code, uh, we can track our changes against each other. Uh, and if something goes wrong, uh, I can go and look in the version control and find out who last changed the thing. And I can go and stand by your desk and tell you why you didn't do that very well in, in the polite version as well. Um, so moving on from there, um, now we get to 2006. Um, Amazon Web Services starts eating the world. Um, and, and this is literally true. That AWS is basically everywhere. Um, and the, this slide comes from, uh, from Amazon's own slide deck. In, the, uh, in the, the data center world I've described so far, where we have a, um, a set of virtual, a set of hypervisor machines running uh, virtual servers, um, we have this kind of dilemma here. The, the, the growth of that infrastructure estate is stepwise. We'll have one big server with some VMs on it, and um, we will know that in future we will probably need some more, and so we'll buy another one. And so this, this sort of stepwise increase of, uh, of provision of capacity um, looks like that. The problem is that demand uh, for server capacity tends to be um, not quite as, uh, as linear as that. Uh, it might have this sort of curve. If you're under providing for the, um, sorry, if, you're, if you have more capacity planned than you are currently using, then you've essentially wasted money. You're spending, you spent, uh, spent capital expenditure on server equipment that you're currently not using that's just sat burning electricity in your data center doing not as much as it could. If you uh, under-provision your, uh, your hypervisors, so if, you're, if you suddenly have a load of new applications to run on virtual servers uh, and you, uh, you don't have enough hypervisors to support that number of virtual servers, uh, then you basically have dissatisfied customers because you have more requirement for processing power than you actually have. Um, and so that's a problem. Um, what AWS uh, kind of did in, in this model is they've taken this, this uh, infrastructure layout where um, your infrastructure team or your outsource infrastructure team is, is managing the hypervisor and the hardware and your application team is managing the, uh, the applications at the top. Uh, and they've basically made it entirely somebody else's problem. So now uh, in an AWS world, um, I don't need to worry about buying hypervisor machines. I don't need to worry about uh, forward planning of, of capacity. I don't need to worry about um, going to data centers or plugging things into, into switches or worrying about CDs or any of that kind of stuff. That entirely becomes someone else's problem. Uh, and that's essentially what cloud is. Cloud is making those computers somebody else's problem. Um, that's the absolute bottom line of this. You're giving that boring work to somebody else. And so the benefit of that looks like this. Um, because Amazon run loads of hypervisors across the world in huge numbers of, uh, of data centers in, in uh, a number of regions uh, for thousands and thousands of customers, uh, they constantly have this machine, uh, supply chain machine that's delivering more capacity as and when they need it. Um, but you as a customer are now consuming only the resources that you need. And so you're paying only for the, uh, for the resources that you're using. And there's no worrying about waste or customer dissatisfaction because the thing that is somebody else's problem takes care of all that noise for you. 
Um, and that's a really powerful thing. Um, and it's obviously really powerful because Amazon make ass loads of money every week now um, and, uh, and are doing very well out of it, thank you very much. Um, so the benefits of this, um, this kind of model is that you're, you're also, um, you're not having to go and talk to an infrastructure team or raise a ticket or pick up the phone or whatever to get a new server provisioned. You are literally going to a web console or you're running a command inside, uh, inside a, a command line tool uh, that will create a new server for you. And then you can log into it and go and do things with it. Um, scalability becomes elastic, so you can use servers only when you need them and throw them away when you're not. Um, and as a result of that, you also, uh, you're also only paying for what you use at the time. Um, up until recently, you were paying by the hour. So if you started a new server up, um, you would start paying uh, after the first hour and then for every hour that you use thereafter. Um, as of the last few months, um, you are now build, I think, by the minute or by the second, in fact. Um, so you could li literally bring a server up for 20 seconds, take it down again, uh, and you're only paying for that 20 seconds of usage. And that, that's economically, you, you can't fault that argument. It's a sensible thing to be doing. Um, and there is, there's no capital expenditure, um, which is scary to people who trade on, who are uh, publicly traded because they love to have capitalized expenditure. Um, there are ways that you can do that in a sort of fiddly accounting way, but you're not having to go out and buy servers. What you're doing is paying operationally for the, the time that you use on them. Um, and it's, it then is a sort of truly on-demand server platform. And to me, that's really exciting still, um, having gone from a, a world where um, you're on call, something goes wrong, you have to drive to Stretford, let yourself into a, into a spooky old house, go down to a potentially damp cellar and figure out what the hell went on with this machine that you couldn't log into remotely, wait for two hours while it rebooted and other, other such things. Now, I can, from the comfort of my desk, spin up an entire infrastructure for a, for a customer with um, high levels of security and uh, high levels of control um, in three different regions around the world, four, five, whatever, uh, and make those servers do what I want. Um, and I don't even have to get dressed if I don't want to, and that's, that's pretty much perfect, right? Um, within reach of the fridge where the beers are, I'm painting a really, really bad impression of myself. It's not, not really a lot of that in my house every day. Um, so other exciting things that have come out of this, uh, this new exciting world are um, these tools, um, Packer and Terraform, which are both from a company called HashiCorp, who are uh, probably the, the company uh, today who best understand how this how this stuff works and how um, and what the what the kind of needs of a of people like us who are running these infrastructures are, um, and what Packer allows is the automation in code of building a machine image that I can give to Amazon to boot servers from. So it's the equivalent of taking that snapshot in VMware and creating servers from it. Um, Packer is allowing me to express in software um, how I want to create um, a server image. Um, Terraform is similar, uh, but Terraform is, uh, works at a higher level and Terraform allows me to express in code, you can see there's a theme here, um, how I want to create cloud infrastructure, where my load balances are, how many servers I want, which region they're in, what networks they're connected to. All of it done by writing software. Uh, none of it done by pointing and clicking through interfaces uh, or by kind of making stuff up on the spot, figuring it out as I go along. This is all pre-planned. I've written this thing, I run it, I get the same result as I got last time. So this is an example from Packer. Um, it's JSON, which is a, a horrible data uh, format. Um, and uh, if you ever do anything in, in uh, web front ends, you'll see an awful lot of this, and I'm very sorry for you. Um, essentially, what we're expressing here, and this is only a small part of, a, of a, what would be a much larger Packer config, um, this is saying that I'm, I'm building a, a machine image for an Amazon EBS type machine. So this is a specific type of Amazon server. Um, I'm taking a, a, an access key and a secret key as variables from the command line. So the secrets that I would use to create a server uh, on Amazon so that I can, uh, I can run this, uh, this, uh, this Packer script, um, I'm providing in on the command line rather than putting it in the code because then that allows me to treat them as more secure items. Unlike Uber a year ago, you might have read in the news, who, uh, who managed to let their secrets leak uh, heinously and, uh, and permit other people to stand up infrastructure and exfiltrate their data. We won't get onto that. Um, 
the uh, the config here says that we're going to create it in US East One, uh, which is a, an Amazon region. Um, it's actually the least reliable because it was their first one, and it's where everything gets tried out all the time. So if you ever find yourself doing stuff with Amazon, ignore US East One because it's flaky as hell. Um, and we're also creating uh, a source AMI filter, which is basically saying, as a as a starting point, I want you to choose from this library of templates to boot the machine and then I'm going to do some things on that machine later. Um, all of this is, uh, is there for code. I can check this into version control. Um, I can run the packer tool against it. I can share this with Tom if he wants to, uh, to stand up some infrastructure using my, my templates and, and his access keys. Um, and we can collaborate on, on how that works. Uh, and crucially, we, this becomes repeatable. So if the first thing that I do on a new server that's stood up is to um, run a package update and make sure all of the software on that uh, on that uh, server is is at the latest version that it can be um, then if i run this on a weekly basis uh, and use the output of this in my uh, infrastructure uh, then every week i can restart everything and get the latest versions of software everywhere um, and i haven't had to remember how i've set those servers up in order to do that it's all just in code and it, it's repeatable from there this next slide is an example of uh, Terraform. Uh, Terraform is configured in a language called uh, HCL, uh, which is almost as awful as JSON, but not quite. Um, and this uh, Terraform uh, lump here is how you might stand up a single AWS uh, server, um, which will uh, then run a package update, install a web server, and start that web server. Very straightforward. Actually, if you're doing stuff with Terraform, there's a lot of other things that you'd have to stand up before you create that, that instance. Um, but all of the ways that you do that looks kind of the same as this. It's all, here's a resource, here's my virtual private network, here's how I define my subnet, here's my gateway. Uh, and we pass those values around um, into different parts of the script uh, so that we're creating the AWS instance in the correct network and so forth. Uh, and again, we're sort of passing variables around here. So the SSH key pair uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the template ID that we're going to stand that infrastructure up from, we're passing in as variables. Uh, again, entirely reusable. Um, we use, in, in the work we do, um, which is building cloud infrastructure for people. I should probably have led with that. Um, the, uh, we, we use Terraform to stand up a foundation of infrastructure for all of our customers that looks more or less the same. And so we collaborate as a team on the scripts that do that. Um, and we run these on a per customer basis. And they get a good practice infrastructure that is a, a shape that we like. Um, and then we can build on top of that to, uh, to provide their, their application services. Again, software. Um, again, no point and click, no, uh, no manual work to get to the point where we are up and running. Um, I'm going to cover briefly, I know I'm slightly over time, um, the things that have happened since then that are kind of interesting uh, and that will make sense uh, to you next time you come back to CodeMill. Um, in 2013, um, the Linux world reinvented containers. Um, I'm going to say reinvented because the, the concept of a container has been around for much longer than, uh, than the software tool that, uh, that is now in, in full usage in, in Linux doing this. Um, we'll go back to the hypervisor design. You can see there we've got virtual machine, a pretend hardware layer, um, a kernel per virtual machine, and apps running on top of that. Um, a container host looks a little more like this, where we have hardware running on the machine, sorry, the, the hardware of the machine itself, uh, and then a kernel running on the hardware, um, similar to, to how we would have on a, on a native application host. Uh, but on top of that, and, and as part of the kernel, which is why I've drawn this box a little closer to it, uh, the container engine. And what the container engine allows you to do is to run a container such as this. I should have put a box around that, actually, um, which by, uh, by virtue of how the container engine works is isolated from the other containers on that machine. Um, this is considered to be more, uh, more performant than, uh, than running a hypervisor because you're not running a pretend kernel or a pretend virtual machine up here with a kernel on it. Uh, everything runs under a single kernel image. And so 
these containers only use the resources that they would need if they were running natively on here, uh, but you have separation of uh, uh, process and, and data uh, between containers to the point where they can't see each other and you can consider them to be secure from each other, uh, broadly speaking, uh, although not all industries have cottoned on to that and trust that yet. Um, the other thing, of course, that it allows you to do is to consider that the container engine downwards is someone else's problem. Um, and so if you're running on um, maybe Google Compute Engine or you are using um, Amazon Elastic Beanstalk or something of that nature, um, you can forget about how all this works. Someone else is going to take care of the security patching and, and do all of the kind of bullshit around plugging it into networks and so forth. Uh, you're just provisioning containers onto it and running applications on there. And the main thing you're going to hear about in that world is Docker. Uh, and if you haven't heard of, of Docker yet, um, if in your uh, quest to become knowledgeable about internet things, I'd be very surprised. Um, and is it Docker that they're talking about your next code mill, or is it going to be the something Azure Azure flavored? Might still be Docker, actually. Docker's everywhere. Docker, right? Yeah, Docker and Azure. Um, and the other thing, of course, about Docker is that the, the way you create those containers is, again, it's code. Like, it's literally just lines in a text file. This is, for my money, actually far worse than the configuration management option. But um, again, it's lines of code um, that do things inside the container that you can then version, treat as software, share with one another. Um, and in fact, this is uh, copy and pasted from a Hello World example uh, on the, uh, the Docker Hub where there are a number of these shared by other people. Um, benefits of this, improved resource usage, as I've said, um, you have a clearer unit of deployability, which um, is a, a sort of uh, an important thing if you're working in a team of software people. Um, it means that you can give the responsibility for what runs on that container to your development team and not have this sort of split responsibility where they have to shout at operations people to get things working. Um, this is something that uh, Matthew's consultancy uh, covers in, in a great deal of detail. Uh, I won't go into that. Um, the other benefit of, of containers and the reason it seems to have been adopted widely is that I think people think it's cool. Um, I, I'm not entirely sold on that, but uh, it, there are definitely benefits to, to this ecosystem. And it's something that if you're getting into um, development in any kind of way, you're going to need to learn about at some point. Uh, beyond that, uh, we get into orchestration, uh, which is a, a layer on top of containers, which allows you to uh, specify how you're going to run those and where. Um, so an orchestrator would let you say, I want 12 of these, and there should be uh, six on in Paris and six in London, uh, and I don't want there to be uh, two of them on the same server or any of that kind of stuff. It's the thing that allows you to make assertions such as um, if, you're, if you're running a clustered data service, uh, the orchestrator is the thing that would let you say, I want each of these three nodes to exist on different pieces of hardware. And if one of them goes away, then I want it to be created somewhere else before either of the other two are taken down anywhere. So making assertions about um, availability and how your application is deployed. Uh, and the main player in this space is called Kubernetes. Um, and uh, this isn't something that I've looked at in huge detail, actually, but there's a diagram that looks like this that covers the concepts. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think essentially the takeaway here is that you should probably not be running this yourself. Um, I know Tom's company is doing that at the moment, but that, until recently that was kind of the only option. Um, keep an eye out for uh, Amazon reInvent uh, next week where I expect they're going to announce one of these as a service. Uh, Google already run one of these as a service, as do Microsoft. Uh, this is probably the first time AWS has been behind the curve on this stuff. But um, Kubernetes is definitely a thing that uh, you will hear about if you start doing anything with containers, um, usually from breathlessly hypey people. Um, but uh, I'm coming around to the idea slowly. Um, and finally, serverless. Like we're taking you all the way from uh, actually having to bother with like ordering boxes uh, of uh, of servers from the uh, from the internet and unpacking them and doing things with them. The one of the sort of latest trends is towards completely ignoring the idea of a server. Um, so in all of the uh, all of the, the models that I've described this evening. Um, at some point, you are worrying about there being a machine or a virtual machine or a container with some libraries in it, or um, you, you have some level of responsibility for how those things are operated, what goes in them, how you secure them, and so forth. Um, this modern kind of approach um, that we're calling serverless actually is probably better referred to as function as a service, um, where 
um, instead of uh, deploying containers or instead of deploying applications, what we're deploying is individual functions and we're gluing those together with, uh, with rules about how they talk to each other. Um, so where you might, uh, if, if you are developing PHP, for example, um, the, the type of, types of functions you might write are create a user, delete a user, change a user's password, go and put a thing in a shopping basket, take a thing out of a shopping basket, take some money from the customer, those sorts of things. In the serverless model, um, each of those functions becomes individually deployable, um, and so you're working at the function level, uh, and that is the ultimate in not giving a fuck about what goes on under that orange line, um, because you just don't know. You have no ability to control it or influence it even. Uh, you are just throwing functions at Amazon or Azure or, uh, or Google and hoping that they do the right thing. Um, and that's pretty interesting. For the time being, um, there are limitations on how you might want to use those. Uh, I will happily talk about those over a beer. Um, primary benefit, no infrastructure to care about, no patching, no monitoring, like, well, probably monitoring, actually, uh, but no, no sort of worrying about what happens under the orange line, because um, almost everything is someone else's problem. Uh, and the main, uh, the main uh, product uh, that is popular in this space is uh, this, which is Amazon Lambda, or AWS Lambda, um, and they seem to be kind of leading the, uh, leading the fold on, on uh, implementation of that. Um, and it's interesting stuff, in fairness. Uh, so today, um, I think where we're at is um, on-premise VMware stuff, more or less dead. There are still some companies that are doing that. Um, all of them want to not be doing it, pretty much. Um, there are some exceptions uh, in areas like finance and uh, pharmaceuticals, other regulated industries who are extremely paranoid about who owns their data or at least where their data is. Um, and so they still kind of cling on to like metal machines in, in data centers, but they're still paying someone else to take care of them and they're probably not actually as secure as the cloud these days. Um, traditional config management, like the puppet chef Ansible story, it's losing favor. There's still bits of it going on. Um, certainly uh, the Kubernetes experts that I know of are recommending installing Kubernetes using something like Ansible or, or puppet or chef. Um, and the, there's still a place for it, but it's definitely not as popular anymore. Um, Packer and Terraform is definitely heavily in use. Uh, HashiCorp are a growing company with a lot of users, um, and there's a lot of stuff going on in that space. Uh, Terraform in particular is, is really changing the game on how we're deploying infrastructure now. The cool kids are using Kubernetes. That includes Tom over there. He's uh, in, included in, in, the, uh, in the cool kids demographic. Is that the first time, or? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not Thomas. There are, there are other cool kids in Tom's organization who are doing that. Um, uh, GitHub are, are using Kubernetes on their, on their front end. Um, uh, if you buy groceries from Ocado, um, they're big Kubernetes users. They use Kubernetes to drive the systems that run the robots that get your chips out of a thing and put them in a bag so that they can go to your house, which is kind of cool. Um, really don't run it yourself, though. Like, as, as of next week, there's literally no excuse to be running around Kubernetes cluster. Um, Lambda, which is the, uh, the serverless stuff, um, is pretty good for asynchronous workloads. So when you can give it something to do, but you don't care how long it takes or when it will finish, um, Lambda is, is useful for that. So certainly for data processing or batch jobs or that sort of thing. Um, and serverless is uh, likely to increase in popularity and is, is doing so all the time. And that is how you get in touch with me if you want to argue with me about any of my assertions this evening. Thank you very much for coming out.